He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, nau mai haramai ki te au hurihanga. Hello and welcome to Our Changing World, ko Clark and Cannon tēnei. There are some classic flavour combos out there. Apple and cinnamon, tomato and basil, cheese and crackers, lime and coconut. Yum. It's called food pairing, and it's been around forever. But while we know some combinations work well and others just don't, we're in the dark as to exactly why. RNZ producer Justin Gregory talks to two local researchers who are looking for the recipe. Some people like some weird food pairings. I like blue cheese and honey. Yikes. And some people are more classic in their choices. I can't go past the cliché of simply cheese and wine. That was Dr Rebecca Jelly. Her field is analytical chemistry and, no shock, wine science. She's into balancing flavour. So, you know, a creamy cheese is supposed to be paired with or balance out essentially the acidity of a crisp white wine. Um, For me, it's probably more likely that when I'm indulging in one of the two, it's just an excuse to crack open the other. Before her, you heard Dr Darnay Larson. She investigates food science and sensory science. Texture is her thing. So, cheese and honey, together, on a cracker. So I really, really like that because of the juxtaposition, I think, of the real umami, salty flavour of the blue cheese and then the sweetness of the honey. Righto. Uh, We like what we like and we love some foods in combination with each other. Everyone knows that, but we don't know why. I think basically it boils down to food being a really complex system and it's not often that we will eat just a single ingredient with another single ingredient. So we've got all these different ingredients making up a food pairing or multiple food pairings, but we don't actually understand the science behind it. Most of the time, I guess, we get told by an expert, maybe a chef or a wine connoisseur, that this goes with that, but there's no real understanding of why that might be. Dane, who lectures in the School of Chemical Sciences at the University of Auckland, and Rebecca, who is a research fellow there, have teamed up to find some answers. They're focusing on foods from New Zealand with the idea that one day they'll have a food pairing network. That means, you know, this wine with this cheese for these scientific reasons. You can see the commercial potential for local food producers right away, can't you? Food pairing is an emerging field of study and has gotten some traction in the last decade or so. There are theories out there at the moment to do with flavour as a key driver of pairings, and also an idea that it might be about shared flavour compounds. Rebecca. In essence, food with more flavour compounds in common, and so flavour compounds primarily we sort of can lump them in as being um, compounds that smell the same or very similar to each other. Um, And so these foods are more likely to taste good together compared to foods or ingredients that don't share as many um, compounds. So this sort of makes the screening of the chemical profile of different foods and beverages a great starting point. Um, And so research has sort of come up with some lesser known pairings and these can include things like blue cheese and chocolate, which Dane would actually quite like by the sounds of things. Um, and these, in fact, share more than 73 flavour compounds. But um, for me anyway, the promise of chocolate isn't going to get me over the hurdle of enjoying blue cheese. Fair enough. So, based on this idea of shared flavour compounds, researchers overseas have harvested information from food chemical databases and then run them through AI to predict some food pairings. Milk chocolate and asparagus, anyone? Prawns and vanilla? Kiwi fruit and gorgonzola cheese? They might well work together. And if you're keen, there are food pairing apps out there so you can try some unusual combinations of your own. Be your own food scientist. But the current theory of shared flavour compounds doesn't fully account for regional differences in diet. Research has shown that there is this tendency for Western cuisines to comprise recipes that have, um, or that are combining different ingredients that have these shared flavour compounds. But in fact, the complete opposite was seen for East Asian cuisines. And so in that sense, this theory or hypothesis behind food pairings um, does fall down. And it's important to note that food choices are complex and you've got an array of different drivers to consider. 
you can't simply overlook the availability of local ingredients or traditions and cultural practices that are all going to come into play. And Dane thinks there's another factor that you shouldn't overlook. They seem to have forgotten about the sensory aspects of food. So texture, the sound of food, the appearance of food. I think, and this is where our hypothesis lies, um, is that sensory attributes actually play a very important part in food pairing as well. Maybe equal to, or maybe more than flavour, or it could be a case of some foods follow more of flavour pairing um, sort of theory and others more a sensory food pairing uh, theory. That's what we want to find out. All right, let's get to the experiment. Rebecca and Dane lead me to the sensory evaluation room attached to a food processing lab. Small cubicles sit side by side, each with a hatch on the wall in front of them, through which the test foods can be transferred. The room is bland. It's lit only by low-level fluoros and without decoration of any kind. I don't know what you imagine when you hear the words sensory room, but this probably isn't it. It tries to minimise bias as much as possible, so it's kind of like a sterile looking <laughs> room, all white, um, but with the control of like temperature, humidity, lighting, noise, that sort of thing, it means that people can really focus on their task at hand, which is obviously tasting the food and then rating their response in whichever way um, we might ask them to do. And how do you prepare the subjects? Do they need to fast? Do they need to do anything? Um, yeah, so it depends on the test. Um, sometimes we'll ask them just to have a normal breakfast, um, but then we'll wait, say, two hours without eating any food, um, and then they can do the, the test. Um, other times we might ask them to fast overnight, um, but generally we try and create sort of as normal as possible, um, the way that a person would be, you know, eating throughout the day. Um, but of course, we don't want them to come full; that they can't eat anything. Using chemical analysis, Dane and Rebecca have created 50 test foods, some of which share a lot of aroma compounds, and some don't, but all of which have some really good sensory elements to them. Today, honor student Nadia is our volunteer test panelist. She's sitting hungrily in one of the booths. Nadia um, is going to try two uh, different foods which may or may not be a food pair based on um, this shared aroma flavour compound theory um, and basically she has two samples um, and she has to put them both in her mouth at the same time and then just chew them, um, have a think about if she likes it or not and then she will rate on a line scale, so 0 to 10, how much she likes that particular food pairing. Um, and then we have a second um, sample as well, which is the same two foods, but they're mixed together um, in a pureed form as well, just to see um, if the, the basically... Whether it's flavour or texture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't want to say too much, but yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> you just let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> My mistake. You didn't hear that. No, um, no. <laughs> do you need to pre-screen the subject at all about what uh, kind of foods yes. they like? Or? Yeah, so first of all, um, any good subject, subject, I'm sorry I'm calling you a subject, um, would be obviously healthy, not on any medication that may affect their sense of taste or smell because a lot of medications do, you haven't had any dental treatment in the last couple of weeks, that sort of thing. Um, but we also want to make sure that someone doesn't have a real aversion to a particular food we're trying because obviously they're not obviously going to try it or they're just going to chuck it in their mouth real quick and try and get rid of it as soon as possible. Um, but with this particular research, we do want people who maybe don't particularly like some foods or not so much, and we want to see if the, the pair um, eating those together might actually improve their likability of the food they don't like so much. Today's food combination is dark chocolate and broccoli. Now, without the backing of that chemical analysis, this isn't perhaps an obvious combination. But as should be clear by now, flavour isn't an obvious thing. Basically when we eat a food, right, we taste a food and we all know we have taste buds on our tongue. Um, we can taste salty, sweet, bitter, umami, etc. Um, and of course that's a sensation that goes to our brain. But flavour is actually a combination of a lot of different sensory experiences. So it's the taste, but it's also smell, um, it's texture, it's touch, um, also just the feeling of food inside our mouth. 
but it's also um, our anticipation of a meal, our cultural background. If we're used to eating a particular food, we're kind of imagining what that food is going to be like before we eat it. And all of this sort of combines together into a perception, which is flavour. So flavour is actually a perception rather than a sensation. While Nadia chews, swallows and perceives the broccoli and chocolate, I want to talk a bit more about the different parts of that perception. Let's start with texture. The texture of food is linked to its structure, right? So if you've got a food like bread that's got lots of little sort of air bubbles in there, um, it gives it a sort of springy texture um, when you apply force to it. So we're looking at force being force biting. could be our, yeah. our teeth, right. right? So it's what happens when force is applied. Um, whereas textural complexity is something that is basically a whole range of different sensations that occur when you put a food in your mouth. So we say from uh, first bite to swallow or sip to swallow. Um, and all those different uh, perception, well, sorry, sensations that we're getting, they give us this really interesting textural journey over time. And that's something a little bit more than just the force applied to a structure. Dane has done work previously on the subject, and with other researchers, she coined the term textural complexity. Textural complexity actually plays a really important role in some key processes in the human body. So we were able to manipulate the textural complexity of a food that we created, and it actually set off the satiation response in people, which is um, this trigger that your brain tells you to stop eating. Say, I'm starting to get comfortably full and I should stop eating now. And we actually figured out that building lots of textural complexity into a food meant that the brain thought we were eating much more food or different types of food than we actually were. And it was actually in the end um, a mechanism that could be applied to restrict the size of a meal if someone ate something texturally complex beforehand. Satiation is my new favourite word, but being part Labrador and pretty much always hungry, it's not something I experience often. Then there's chewing and oral processing and oral transit time. So basically, this is the time um, that the food is in your mouth, right? So oral transit may be when you're drinking wine. Um, not a lot has to be done to that wine. You sip it and probably swallow it but if you were tasting like in a professional setting you might sip and then you know drag some air in and swirl it around and that sort of thing mm. um, but that is literally the time from sip to swallow or bite to swallow um, oral processing time is very similar but of course the processing would be the mastication or the chewing of the food um, also how and how long we need for it to be chewed down into a bolus that would be safe to swallow and this is something that people can play Play with um, going back to that whole satiation thing. Um, previous research um, by others showed that if you could increase that oral processing or oral transit time, then satiation would occur faster. We, on the other hand, were able to prove that if we just increase textual complexity um, of the food you were eating, regardless of the processing time or oral transit time, um, you would full, feel full faster. So you want to find a food. Um, say that hasn't been created in real life that has your crispy your crunchy maybe some slimy maybe some springy some chewy in it and it just really does make you feel like you've eaten a lot of different things therefore i must be starting to get full crispy crunchy slimy springy chewy full food pairing is complex it is, it is a complex area. Possibly this is why people are still not quite sure why food pairing actually works. Back to Nadia, who hopefully perceives all those things as she chows down on dark chocolate and broccoli. I'm going to start with the two at the same time, right? Yeah. So a small piece of chocolate um, I'm putting in my mouth. Um, and then a small piece of broccoli, <laughs> which is nice and green. So it's dark chocolate. So the texture of the broccoli is really coming through <laughs> when I'm tasting the sample. The chocolate disappeared really quickly actually. But honestly this isn't... I don't know what to expect but this pairing isn't that bad to me. Oh, wow. But definitely heavy on the broccoli side of things rather than the chocolate. Right. 
you may not seek it out in your private life. <laughs> <laughs> so you can rate on the line scale approximately mm -hmm. just on the top one mm -hmm. where you might put that in terms of how much you like it. So between dislike, dislike extremely and like extremely. Mm -hmm. Just slide it along. A sip of water to cleanse her palate and then Nadia is into the second part of this experiment. I have a, a lot less appetising sample in front of me compared to the broccoli and the chocolate separately. Um, instead I have, yeah, an interesting looking puree of chocolate and broccoli with, yeah, just kind of this goopy looking substance with chocolate, like with broccoli interspersed. Yeah, um, I might even call it chocolate if this is going to catch on. Um, it's not visually a, a real winner, is it? It's not no, particularly... Yeah. No, it's What is looking at it going to do? So, yeah, this is a very good question. So, a lot of our... Because I know what it's doing to me. Yeah, 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 yeah me too, don't worry. <laughs> a lot of our... Um, how, we, how much we actually like a food is based on what we see. Because we eat with our eyes, right? That's the first of our senses, basically, to give us some information about what we might be getting ready to eat. So... Possibly now that Nadia has stared at it long enough, she's putting herself off it. But let's see. We'll try it and see what you think. Okay. Here, here goes. This one is very. I th I think it's definitely a different experience to putting them two separately together. The idea of that all kind of mixed together, mm. you know, like way more than I would just by eating them in my mouth. I think the fact is, right, like I stared at it for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I psyched myself out a little bit because it's, yeah, I, I'm not tasting them as separately as I was before. Like they're already, yeah, I'm not tasting broccoli and then chocolate. I'm really tasting both <laughs> in a way that maybe it isn't as nice. Oh, that's interesting. So whereabouts would you rate that on your line scale? I, I'd probably put it, yeah, lower, lower okay. down. Not so low though. Not so low because I, I think that I could, if I ate enough of it, this is something I could get used to potentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not the worst thing I've eaten, and I'm a student, <laughs> <laughs> so that explains a bit. Well said. Yeah. So we've um, that's really interesting actually. So perhaps we could say that texture might play a bit more of an important role um, in this pairing, considering she liked the first one when they were just there, basically their individual ingredients a bit more. Um, it could also be that she did look at it a bit too much. So in a, a normal setting, we would just very quickly make the person try the food without contemplating it too long. Um, but as you can see, it's exactly the same foods, but a very different sensory experience. So if you want to come over here. Mm -hmm. Now this um, particular test, again, we're still using dark chocolate and broccoli, even though Nadia shouldn't know what's in the box. But this time we've got a little sensory box that the food is placed in and the person who's trying it actually doesn't know what it is or they're not going to look at it. So what she just did before where she looked at that food for too long and it psyched herself out, um, hopefully this won't happen with this particular test. So under the um, cloche, I think you call it, the glass um, stand is a whole lot of chocolate, right? So Nadia's staring at it, as I can see she is, <laughs> and thinking, wow, this looks good. I assume you like chocolate. Yes. So you're thinking, mm, this is going to be really tasty. So what I'll get you to do now is pop this up to your mouth. Um, your nose just goes there. Mm -hmm. This being and the small box. This is a little box. And once you have your nose and mouth there, um, you'll just open the little gate and just gently tilt it back and put the food in your mouth without looking at it. But the whole time you should be looking at your chocolate. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking nice chocolate thoughts. <laughs> and of course you can't smell the chocolate, right? Because you, it's under a, um, a dome. So I'm going to open the little gate. <laughs> this is quite, quite a funny visual actually for everyone in the room. I'm like leaning back to, to like leaning my head back with a box in front of my mouth. Now you can look at the, the chocolate. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Based on the texture, 
I think I just ate broccoli. <laughs> um, it was really interesting looking at the chocolate while I was eating what was in my mouth. I guess I think of the broccoli being quite a like grassy kind of flavor and that when I was eating it while looking at the chocolate, I didn't taste that as much, if that makes sense. Like it was less grassy, it was, yeah, I think I really like, I really focused on the texture as I was eating it. Like the flavor wasn't as intense for me. Mm. That's really interesting you say that because that's literally what this kind of um, experiment is trying to show us, right? This is called flavor, flavor learning. So your flavor of your broccoli, while you might find it intense, say in the grassy notes, and maybe that's something that you might not enjoy as much, um, because you're looking at chocolate, which actually shares a lot of compounds with broccoli, this is why we're actually doing this particular test, actually a significant amount of compounds. Um, so there's a lot of sulfur compounds in both of them. Sulfur? Yeah, so of course, chocolate has a lot of different compounds, but one of the ones that is very common in both is actually um, a sulfur compound. Yeah. So um, I guess you can possibly smell it in broccoli if you think about cooking broccoli, right? Um, but yeah, so by looking at chocolate, so she can't smell the chocolate obviously, but by looking at it, her brain is telling her what that chocolate tastes like based on her previous experience. And then while she eats the broccoli, she's just not looking at the broccoli, she's just tasting it and the two combined are actually making her like that broccoli a little bit more than what she would um, if she didn't have the chocolate or possibly if she ate the two together like she did in the previous experiment. Yeah I think like what I'm looking at and how I'm thinking about my food can really shape my enjoyment of mm. eating it. <laughs> so what if you were looking at broccoli and eating chocolate? Oh uh, I think Chocolate is a sacred experience. Um, <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think, like, I, I just, I feel like I wouldn't enjoy eating chocolate as much if I was having to look at broccoli. <laughs> I guess, like, right, like, it might also play into, like, you know, like, what foods we think of as, like, healthy and unhealthy. And mm. so, like, chocolate is a bit of a treat, you know, and you might feel guilty looking at the broccoli going, oh, I should be eating something healthier or kind of the other way around. I guess this is also one of the applications of this research, right? So if we can show that, say, Nadia actually enjoys her broccoli a little bit more when chocolate is associated in some form, even though it is a weird food combination, um, perhaps in the future you might see a chocolate bar that is actually filled with a broccoli uh, filling right but because there's chocolate there they share their compounds and whichever way the texture is more liked we'll you know you make the filling people might eat more broccoli right because it's in a chocolate bar <laughs> you know it's it's a, it's a it's bit a, of a reach I don't know you never know I think I'd eat it <laughs> Nadia would wouldn't you <laughs> but I mean basically you can some of these healthy foods well let's face it a lot of healthy foods people don't like usually as much and that's why you know they don't eat them but maybe we could use some of the findings from this research to figure out a way to make healthy foods taste better or seem to taste better um, and that's one of the goals of this research as well. And for you what's never going to work for you? Oh big question. Um, I think for me I get kind of the, I, the ick factor for cheese being paired with things sometimes which is strange like cheese in a salad like cheese with lettuce is not something that comes to mind despite it being like a really common pairing like a lot of people have cheese in their salads um yeah and I think it's kind of the two I guess like the strong flavor of the cheese in contrast to kind of a weak flavor in the salad and the textures interacting yeah mm -hmm. It could be also uh, um, something to do with dominance, so flavour dominance, if one is more dominant over the other sometimes um, we don't like that or we want to create more of a balance and um, this is something also we, we look at as well, so over time how the dominance of different flavours um, change while it's in our mouth and yeah, so when we do these experiments we try to balance the two flavours or the two foods I should say as much as possible, so you might have noticed there was a slightly larger piece of broccoli and a small 
smaller piece of chocolate just because chocolate would naturally be more dominant. So we, we do try and pre sort of test those levels just to make sure that um, you are tasting both of the foods when you do the experiment. Where to from here in the research? That's an exciting question. Um, oh, I guess a lot of the stuff, well, the, the side of um, the research that I'm involved in, we're just sort of starting out now. So while Dana's done a lot of sort of preliminary work, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely an exciting era to be involved in, um, coming on board and getting to understand the chemistry side of things. So from here, securing some funding, of course, that's what we do in research, and um, yeah, trying to see what we can find out. I'm pretty excited about it. Especially in a New Zealand context, I think, um, because uh, as I said, none of these studies have been done in New Zealand. Um, and we have a very unique food landscape here. Um, there's a lot of different cultures bring their part in food um, to what we eat. You know, fusion is huge in New Zealand, so we want to see if actually the science backs up our our tastes down here and I think it would be really exciting to actually figure out what our sensory preferences are to do with food pairing. Maybe flavour is everything for New Zealanders, maybe it's texture, maybe it's sound, who knows. Namahi. Thanks to Dr. Danae Larson, Dr. Rebecca Jelly and test subject honour student Nadia. All from Waipapa Tamataro, the University of Auckland. This episode was produced by Justin Gregory with help from me and Ellen Rikers. Sound engineering was by Jeremy Veal and Phil Bench, and Tim Walken is executive producer of podcasts and series at RNZ. If you want to know more about this topic, our webpage is at rnz.co.nz slash Our Changing World. And you can reach us on social media too. We are on X, formerly known as Twitter, or Facebook, where we are at RNZ Science. Kia faia i te au hurehanga i te tahi taubanga paia ki kia koe. Follow the Our Changing World podcast on your favourite podcast app. And if you enjoy listening to the show, please do help spread the word about it. Even just tell one friend. It really helps. Te nā koe i whakarongo mai. Thanks so much for listening. Ko Claire and Kana Have a great week. Kia pai. Bō wiki.